The next category is the poetry competition, which was judged this year by Anne Barclay. Anne Barclay's poems have been published widely and have won prizes in many competitions, um, to include Times Literary Supplement, Arvon, um, and her first collection, The Men from Praga, published by Salk, was shortlisted for the Seamus Heaney Centre Prize. She's performed around England and Wales and in New York with the poetry ensemble, The Joy of Six. She edited Rebecca Elson's acclaimed posthumous collection, A Responsibility to All, which has now been reissued as a Kakarnet classic. Hello. First of all, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to judge this competition. And I'd like to thank all the poets who entered and trusted me with their work. We had about 1300 entries from around the world and I read all of them at least twice. They were all anonymous. I was looking for poems that didn't look like poems I'd read before, poems that held my attention even after I'd finished reading. I sorted them into piles of yes, no and maybe and I reread them. I reread the no pile to make sure I hadn't missed anything out. Subject matter was very varied. Um, the competition closed before the Ukraine war broke out and um, nevertheless there were poems that touched on war because it's always going on somewhere in the world. It's a perennial and horrific subject. There were a few poems that touched on the COVID epidemic, but the vast majority of poems were about aspects of human relationships, love, separation, ageing, death. We had poem, poets who included snippets of other languages, not just the home languages of Welsh, Gaelic, Scottish dialect, but also Hindi, Greek, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Mandarin. And even when there isn't a gloss with the internet these days, we're lucky to be no longer limited to the vocabulary we carry in our head. There were all sorts of forms too, sonnets, philanels, sestinas, ballads. There were humorous poems, there were dark, introspective poems with short lines poems with experimental punctuation or with none. I whittled it down to a long list of 120 and then set about rereading and rereading until I had a short list. And congratulations, if you're on that short list, it means that your work endured many rereadings. And congratulations above all to the winners. What impressed me most about their work was the sureness of tone. These are people who are capable, confident, in charge of their material and their vocal range. And these are poems that you can trust. Third prize goes to Vanessa Lampert for her poem Halloween. It's a single stanza of free verse and deceptively simple. I like the relaxed informal tone, the humour, the way the relationship is revealed and the forgiveness in the room. I like the way the ophthalmology is picked up by the plastic pumpkins and the snooker balls, the vivid descriptions, the plastic shell, the size of a satsuma and all the colours of hurt. The cabri and language are skillfully controlled here to let the reader in to the difficult intimacies of this family relationship. Hello, my name is Vanessa Lampert. Thank you so much for awarding my poem third prize. Um, my poem is about the very complicated relationships that um, step parents have with their stepchildren and vice versa. And it's called Halloween. Plastic pumpkins are stacked in Sainsbury's. Family bags of Harry Bows, two for one. I'm driving to Mum's to see my stepfather, just discharged from ophthalmology. He's watching the snooker in his recliner, foot dressed up. On screen, a man in a suit 
leans in to pocket the pink. A plastic cup the size of a satsuma is taped over my stepfather's eye. All the colours of hurt are under it. Violet and charcoal, mustard edged. His eye is puffed up and shut. Dark stitches and dried blood map the contour of the socket. I say, that looks sore. He lifts the remote to mute the volume, studies me with his good blue eye. And a small creature wakes in me after years of sleep and stretches out. I tell my stepfather we're going trick or treating with him dressed as a blue bottle. I say, all we need is a plastic cup for your good eye. I say, let's pop you into a black bin bag and fashion you wings from cling film and wire coat hangers. I say, I'll go and charge your electric buggy in the shed. Then he laughs and forgiveness is in the room like the light from the last candle on a birthday cake. You didn't have enough breath to blow out. Second prize goes to Freya Bantiv for her poem, Penelope's Perspective, cutting up the bed to offer him olive branches. Remember that only Odysseus himself would know the secret of how his bed was made and the impossibility of moving it. So it's a clever test she's setting him to prove he really is who he says he is, returning after 20 years away. It's a poem in long unrhymed couplets with a final single line, an arresting opening that holds the metaphor well throughout the poem. And the story is told with great assurance and ep epigrammatic wit, it's psychologically sharp, recognising how Penelope is hurt by all the lies of the wandering hero. And um, there's, a, there's a great appreciation of the wisdom and weariness of the older woman who's heard all the excuses and is more than a match for Odysseus in her wit and resourcefulness. And it, contrasts the expectations of society and the voices of Dizisius and Penelope herself and there's a delicious wrong footing of the reader in that last line break. Hello everyone, first of all a huge thank you to the judges for choosing my poem. This piece was inspired by one of the final scenes in the Odyssey where Odysseus lies in bed with his wife Penelope telling her about the fantastic places he's seen and the goddesses he slept with. And I wanted to consider her point of view and whether she thought her husband actually returned at all. It's called Penelope's Perspective, cutting up the bed to offer him olive branches. How to, how to admit I have a shipwreck in my bed where a man should be. My sacro city is shuddering in his sleep as if he cannot make the crossing. My snapped bow man. How he plucked strings with the sound of swallows, but could not carry his journey so lightly. You, Eclea, could only recognise him by a scar. Only wounds travel well. But I trace in the map of his face the great names. Isthmus, Aeolia, Aegegia. Scylla and Charybdis as twin tear troughs. Cynicea, a darkened sunspot. His lips drip with other women's names. They're rubbed in his skin like brine. Not women. Goddesses. Immortality, he says. Everlasting youth. I was offered this. On nights when I want to be hurt, I ask, why didn't you take it? You, he answers, not looking at me. He always handled his weapons so carelessly. This, the man who gave up even his own name and something vital with it. I've finished his father's shroud, but fear it fits his measurements. I'm quick to throw the bedsheets off, come morning. Hero, they call him. What is hero but a cast-off man? What is hero but humanity cast off? They played wedding songs the night he came home. A beggar not bathed in blood but drowning in it. The serving maids hung as garlands swinging from their necks. The costume's off and I still can't see him. I beg for the familiar. Touch me, I think, not as an oar or a sword, but as a woman. Your limbs, he says, are white as moly. You liar, I think to call me antidote. He survives in stories, 
he survives through his stories. In our tree-carved bed, I offer an olive branch over and over. I climb across the planks, across the dowels of his interlocking joints, across the decking of his chest, then up the gunwales to the halyards, to raise the great mast of his mind. With a fine wind, I weave the only words he wants to hear. Go on, my love, I whisper. Tell it all to me, again. First Prize, Motherland by Jenny Mitchell. The poems were all submitted anonymously, but the voice in this was so distinctive, the formal skill. I had a strong hunch it was by Jenny Mitchell, having read her prize-winning book, Map of a Plantation. This poem tells eloquently a devastating story that will not let go. The reader is made complicit in the indignities and injustices visited on the dead mother as they are enumerated over a life of poverty and outrageous exploitation and discrimination. The speaker's pain and anger are implicit in the formal control. The last line is devastating. The action of the speaker in washing the body is one of love, preparing it for the afterlife, but also washing away the details that only the living person was witness to. Motherland. Morning breaks with her last breath, laid on a bed, white as an unlined page, in contrast to her skin. Black ink shows at the neck, more beneath the blouse, strange tattooed self, whole body scarred, till I look close. There's all the world she's known, her lost Jamaican home, lush land across wide shoulder blades, a stream flows from her waist, large breasts are hills, she climbs up to the family crop, her navel leads towards a road, bright lights along her gut, dim to an austere house, she cleans for the white priest, master to his flock, he forces her to kneel, Prayers, not the ecstasy he seeks. Her belly swells, the child born dead. She has to leave. The image of a ship floats along one thigh. Waves crash in cellulite on either hip, beside white cliffs of Dover. A hotel near the Harrow Road displays this sign. No blacks allowed. She cleans ten rooms, but cannot board with other maids. Hard to believe, religion is the first thing she seeks out. A Pentecostal church where she meets Dad is etched across one shin, his bold face on the next, beside a high-rise flat. Her nurse's uniform is pictured on her inner thigh. His goodbye note is copied on both feet. She tiptoed to old age, asked me to bathe her when she died. I didn't know she meant to wash her life away. Thank you. 